Good morning. One of my favorite singer-songwriters, and I have a very short list, I'll share it with you one day or I'll share it with you offline if you ever ask. Uh, one of my favorite singer-songwriters is Patty Griffin. Um, about 20 years ago, Lydia and I bought every album she had, had, had produced or, or, or put out at that, at that moment in time. We had about, we still have about five of her albums. She's a little older than us. She's continued to produce albums, continue to record albums rather. Uh, and uh, for about 15 years, I sort of left her music and put her CDs away and, and forgot about uh, Patty Griffin. And then, and then this past year, we've, through the magic of uh, Apple Music, we've sort of rediscovered her, uh, her music. And I've been listening to some of her really, uh, her older albums. Um, in, in one of her, in her first album actually, which is called Living With Ghosts, uh, it, was, it was produced in 1996, so it's, uh, that, that's even before I was listening to her music. But in this first album, uh, Living With Ghosts, uh, she describes herself in this, this, what I believe to be a self-reflective song. Um, she describes herself as, um, as one with, f as a fiery-haired, brown-eyed schemer. And I think that's, if you listen to the, the body of her work, uh, it's really a creative and accurate description of who she is as an artist, who she is um, as an author. Um, as I said, this first album is, is quite self-reflective. She doesn't necessarily admit that, but I believe that to be the case. And there's a song, there's a song in which she speaks of a fiery-haired, brown-eyed schemer by the name of Lorraine. And I've been listening to this song, for whatever reason, I've been listening to this song a lot in the last month. And, and by the way, today is a real day in the next three weeks, today and two more weeks, really weeks of self-reflection. So if you hate self-reflection, you're going to hate church the next three weeks. Uh, but it's good for us. It's good for us from time to time. 2019 for me has really been a, a year of self Reflection. So, so, uh, so Patty Griffin, um, in this song that I believe is, is a song of self-reflection for her, she describes Lorraine like this. Um, this is sweet Lorraine with fiery hair, brown-eyed schemer. She says, Lorraine, who spoke of paintings in Paris and outlandish things to her family just to scare us, Lorraine, whose heart went poking where it, uh, where it shouldn't ought, whose mother could only spit at the thought of Lorraine. And sadly, the song describes Lorraine as a, as a, as a dreamer, as someone who has uh, deep desires in life, uh, but the sad part is, in the song, her dreams and her desires go largely unmet because of the, um, because of her life circumstances, because of her family circumstances, which seem to limit her for her, her entire life. Uh, the, the dreams and the desires that she, that she has, they, they, that, that she has, they, they, they go largely unmet. She tries her best, but she just doesn't quite reach uh, to the degree that she hoped to reach with her life. And, and we would say that is, that is sad, and that would be accurate. That is sad that, that limiting factors have caused her to not really live out her dreams and, and her desires. But could we also agree that, 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 that in our lives, while some of us, many of us, have dreams and desires which are good and, and right, and, 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 and yet can we also agree that, that, that we have desires at times that just, they just, they just kill us. They just, they just, uh, they, they have a, an incredibly damaging uh, impact 
on our lives. And, and, and t so over the next few weeks, this is the title that we're, that we're going to be looking at over the next three weeks, and that is desire when good things become ultimate things. Many of us have good desires and, and dreams, and, and I, hope you, I hope you reach, I hope you succeed in, in, in accomplish your, your, your dreams, your desires. <clears throat> Some of us have dreams, desires which have, have become too significant to the point that they've, they've, they've become ultimate and, and we may never reach them and we may just die spiritually in the process of never reaching these good desires and dreams which we have made ultimate in our lives. And that may not make sense to you right now, but I think over the course of today and over the next three weeks, perhaps, perhaps this will be deeply helpful for you as, as it has been deeply helpful for me. The summer of 2003, Lydia and I were young parents and we were living in, <clears throat> in Albuquerque, New Mexico and we were part of a church plant that was growing and, and I was also running a small business uh, to pay the bills and um, and I was, I, was, uh, I was really, really deeply involved in training, physical training, for uh, a half Ironman, which is a, a triathlon, a race. I was going to that summer race in the, the Buffalo Springs Half Ironman. And, and I did that. It's the, only one, it's the only half Ironman I've ever done. Um, but what I want to tell you about is that summer and how this, this, this desire to, to be healthful and this desire to reach a goal, uh, this desire to start what I'd finished, uh, this, dire, this, this desire to, to actually uh, fin finish a half Ironman, how that, how that good desire um, really spiraled downward and really had a, a negative impact on me and, and, and my family. Um, I, I found that I thought too much about training. Uh, I found that, that everything else was a distraction because in my mind everything else got in the way of me being able to put in miles, uh, uh, going out for a long run, or going for an early Saturday, mo Saturday morning uh, bicycle, you know, high tempo speed bicycle racer, or, or making it to the pool to put in the laps so that I could, could, could ultimately reach this, what started out as a good dream or desire to compete and to complete what I had started. And I, and I, I tried to hide this um, sort of sickness that I had acquired. I tried to hide it from my friends and, and hide it from my church and kind of kept it on the down low and didn't talk much about how much I was training. But, but my wife, uh, because my wife knows me, uh, Guys, your, your wife, she's your report card, right? So my wife, she would, she would bring it up from time to time, and I would just try and change the subject. I would try to quickly cut the conversation short and move on to something else. Or in my training and in my, my, uh, my attempt to hide it from, from others, I would, I, would, I, would, I would get up earlier on a Saturday morning so as to try and get that done before, before the fa so that it wouldn't impact the, the family so much. But when you're out on a three-hour bicycle ride, it's of course going to affect the family. Or then out of guilt, I would try on Saturday nights to, to go out to eat, take my wife and children out to eat, to try, kind of make up for the time that, I'm, that, I've, that I robbed them of on Saturday mornings. And so something that was initially a good desire, it had just become ultimate in my life, and it had taken control, and it was now harmful. And what I, what I find, the, the tension that I felt, maybe you can relate to this tension. The tension that I felt uh, in my life in those days, and it was really a year, long, a year of training, but especially that summer, what I, what I found that what I needed to do with my time, work, leading a church, caring for my family, what I needed to do with my time, and what I wanted to do with my time, they were at war. 
So I ask, have you found that in 2019, what you had to do with your time and what you wanted to do with your time were two different things? Maybe you found yourself saying, I really wanted to do this, uh, but I really had to do that. Yeah, maybe that's the description of how you feel secretly about your relationships right now, or your family right now, or your work. Right? I, I had to do, I was obligated to do this, but, but I really wanted to do that. The Caulfield family, Lydia and the kids and I, about this time of year, and we've already kind of started this process, uh, this time of year between Christmas and New Year's Day, we make a list of what each person wants to do the following year. It's lighthearted, it's profound, meaning some of our answers are lighthearted, and some of our answers are deep and profound. Well, we make a list of what we hope to accomplish over the next year. And in some years, some of us are quite successful. This year, I don't think I accomplished anything, uh, maybe one thing on my, on my list, and that's okay. Most of those are going on the list for 2020. Um, but the fact is, every one of us in this room, we all have unmet desires. And how we deal with those unmet desires really defines us. Our unmet, de our unmet desires, are often they cause conflict in your relationships. Unmet desires cause, co cause conflict in, in, in families, in marriages. James 4 says this, what causes quarrels? And what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? Can you relate to that? Do you ever feel that way? You, you desire and do not have. Now, James 4 really goes deep. It's, it's a deep well to draw from. We will be looking at James 4 over the next three weeks as we'll look at Romans 12 more over the next few weeks. Today we're just intro and we're just kind of scratching the surface but can you relate to this verse don't answer out loud but can you relate to this passage that that unmet desires passions at war within me I, I desire and I do not have and it causes quarrels and it causes fights and it causes tension and it causes stress men maybe there's something you wanted to do with your buddies this year and it didn't happen because of time or money constraints. And maybe you blame your wife. Ladies, maybe you uh, wanted that vacation or that time together as a family and it just didn't work out. What you wanted to do and what you had to do, they just didn't match up. We will always in this life have unmet desires. How we deal with our unmet desires defines us. Maybe you've said to your spouse, maybe you've said this silently to yourself, why can't you just be happy with what you have? We say that to one another all the time. Pop singers sing of it all the time. Why can't you just be happy with what you have? And, and if you've answered that question internally like I have, uh, it goes something like this. It's just not that easy. I wish I could be happy with what I have. It's just not that easy. It's a place that we commonly go. We go inward. And we start contemplating the, the futility. The, 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 the waste, the lack of fulfillment. Solomon did that. King Solomon did that in the book of Ecclesiastes. I caution you, we have to be careful with this book. This book is contemplative and it is relatable, but you have to read all the way to the end of the book, else else the book might lead to your demise. Uh, we can relate to this. We can relate to this, but this is not the end. Okay? This is not the end of 
the equation. This is just the middle. I came to hate all my hard work here on earth, for I must leave to others everything I have earned. Like ungrateful kids, like I worked so hard and you're going to get it all. Uh, Verse 19, and who can tell whether my successors will be wise or will be foolish? Yet they will control everything I have gained by my skill and hard work under the sun. How meaningless. This isn't Solomon knocking his kids or knocking his heirs. He's just questioning all the hard work that he's done. How meaningless. So I gave up in despair questioning the value of all my hard work in this world. It's not a pretty picture, but I I put it up here because I think we can all relate. And if you're wired like I am emotionally, this is the time of year where we start kind of thinking this way. And and what's God's perspective? How do we we take the gospel, the story of Jesus Christ, and, and infuse our mixed up emotions. Uh, how do we do that? If, if I can chase a, a, a rabbit for just a moment and kind of kind of open up my own heart, let you kind of look in to my own personal wiring, how I'm made up. When I struggle with this, and when, when I say this, when I struggle with what I have accomplished in life or what I haven't accomplished in life, When you struggle with whether or not you have the perfect job, the perfect family, when we struggle with the idea of, of, I've uh, I've only got one life, have I made of it all I can? Have I reached my full potential? Have I left, am I leaving a legacy? Well, we ask that question because I can say as a man who's just starting to get a little older, you, you move into, some of you are there, some of you will be there, you move into a stage in life where you start to question like, like what if I haven't left a legacy? What if, what if all this was, was a waste? What, what, if, what if I really didn't live up to my full potential? And what I want to say is, as Christ's followers, that perspective is so short-sighted. And what I remind myself is this. I, I, am, I am designed as a child of God to live for eternity. And I, I've, I've preached on heaven before. I don't have time to, to delve into this today, but what I want you to understand is that, that heaven, the kingdom of God, this new Jerusalem that we will live in for eternity in that city, in that realm, there will be relationships for eternity. There will be work and industry for eternity. There will be food, and there will be joy, and there will be reward, and there will be fulfillment for eternity. Here's my point. As I seek to make much of this life, Even if I barely skid into heaven, I still have an eternity to be fulfilled and to to seek and find glorious pleasure and to, to be involved in industry and to eat good food and to seek good relationships and, and to relate to, the, to, to my Heavenly Father and to know my Savior Jesus for eternity. We put so much weight on this life and so much weight. It becomes some, somewhat of a selfish endeavor. We put so much weight on this life that I must make the most of my life. This defines me. What I want you to understand, this is a gospel ethic. This is a Christian ethic. This does not define you. The legacy that you leave, whatever you do with your life, what I am doing now does not define me. This is just what I'm doing now. It's it's not the legacy 
that I'm leaving. I, I believe if we want to talk about legacy, I believe that legacy is really wrapped up in relationships. I think that there's a biblical precedent for that. That, that, relate, that if we want to talk about legacy, we find it in our relationships, we find it in our children, we, we, we find it in, in the web of community and relationships that we live out. So if you want to worry about legacy, think in those terms. Um, but where I really want to go today is this. Our desires and the fulfillment of our desires, they're, they're, they're wrapped up in our relationships. They're not wrapped up in the stuff that we do and they're not wrapped up in the accomplishments that we achieve. Here's a pretty well-known quote. You may have read it before. It's C.S. Lewis. It's a familiar quote to some of us, but... but it's, it's, it's poignant, it's, it's important, it's significant. C.S. Lewis said this, If we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. Let's unpack that. C.S. Lewis. We can relate to part A of this, of this equation, I believe. It says, if we find ourselves with a desire that, that nothing in this world can satisfy, I go, I go to, to, uh, I go to uh, exercise and sport, and, and, and I, I find that, that there's nothing that satisfies my desires into that. I go to, uh, to, to, to leisure and play. And I, and I find that there's, there's nothing that really satisfies me here. Not, not ultimately. I go, to, um, I go to fine wine and libations. And I find it, it, it's, it's enjoyable, but it is not ultimately fulfilling. And I go here, and I go there. We go to relationships. And we say relationships, they're sweet, but they ultimately don't do it. Not completely. And for some of us, even less than others. And what C.S. Lewis is saying is you bounce around from life to life and you realize nothing in this world really fulfills my desire. <clears throat> the, the, logical, the logical conclusion is, ah, I must be purpose-built <clears throat> for another world. That, my friends, I believe is exceedingly good news. <laughs> No wonder I'm not completely satisfied in this life with my hard work, with my human relationships, with my hobbies. It's because I was made for more than just what this world offers. And things are going to get better. And things are going to continue to get better. And things will get better for eternity. Imagine how great life will be in 100 years. Imagine how great life will be in 200 years for eternity. That is a Christian ethic. If you're a Christ follower, then you're obliged or you, are, you, you should be compelled to believe that. This is not your best life now. It will only get better. Hebrews 11 gives us a picture of what... I'm going to preach on that, what I just showed you next week. It's Hebrews 11 is here somewhere. Let me find it. All right, I don't have it. I'm going to read it for you. I may have skipped it somewhere. I think it's in there, but... Here's what Hebrews 11 says. See if you can relate to this. <clears throat> Hebrews 11 says this. Speaking of the children of God, it says this. They desire a better country. That is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Let me read that again. They, the children of God, they desire a better country. They desire a, a heavenly country. And God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. God is preparing for us a home, a city, a country, a place, an eternal kingdom. 
So why do we get so caught up in our current unmet desire when we're supposed to hold to this belief system that our, our deepest desires will be met for eternity? Why do we get so caught up? And I think the reason is this. Desires that are good become ultimate. And when they become ultimate, they become harmful. Desires that start out as good, and we make them into God with a little g, they become harmful. So, here's a question. We're not going to take very long on this question. The, the, the second question we're going to really camp out on. But here's a question that I want you to answer. You don't have to write this down, the answer to this one down. You can. The next question we're going to spend some time writing on. But here's a question I have for you. What desire has become way too important in my life? No elbows, no, no helping one another with their answers. Oh, I know yours. Worry about yourself. Think on this for a moment. And I'm even going to do that. Um, I'm just going to briefly... We're going to move on from this question quickly, but I'm going to briefly write down my answer, and you write down your answer. What desire has become way too important in my life? Think on that and write it down if you're comfortable doing so. take long on that one, as I said. Here's what I want to point out. There's an unmistakable connection between the conflict in your life and the desires that have come to rule your heart. Let me say that again. There is an unmistakable connection between the conflict in your life and the desires that have come to rule your heart. James 4, which we looked at earlier, we'll look at more next week, says so. I'm going to show you a diagram by a, a, a pastor, really smart guy, good author by the name of Paul David, Paul David Tripp. And uh, here's a diagram of how our desires go. See if, you can, see if you can relate to this. Again, this is about how our unmet desires that come to rule our heart lead to deep conflict. See if you can relate to this. The desire often starts like this. I, I want it. We, we, we determine that what it is. I want it. And it, and it, it moves down this, this road of, of, of that lacks any sort of health or well-being. It leads toward desire. I mean demand rather. I must have it. We move a little bit further down this deadly road and it becomes a need. I will have it. Perhaps at all costs, I will have it. And then, then it starts damaging other people because it, it becomes an expectation. It says, you should... Fill in the blank. You should allow me to have this. You should allow me to spend money on this. You should allow me the time, afford me this opportunity. And then it becomes a disappointment. You didn't, and therefore I don't have what I must have, what I need to have. And it goes ultimately from a, a disappointment, it, it, it moves to the level of punishment. Because you didn't, 
I will now fill in the blank determining the punishment. Perhaps you can relate. Perhaps all of us can relate. So I ask again, what is ruling your heart today, late in, late in 2019? Because we want, we, want, we want 2020, no matter how good 2019 was, we want 2020 to be a better year. I ask, what is ruling your heart that was never intended to rule your heart? Next week, we're going to talk more about idols and how our heart is like a little idol factory and we're constantly making up new things to worship. But for today, what is ruling your heart that was never intended to rule your heart? Like you've set up a little kingdom with this throne of expectation and you have this expectation that everyone will play by your rules and work toward your kingdom goals. And, and, and what, what is ruling your heart that was never intended to rule your heart? We know, we say, we claim a Christian ethic. Jesus is to rule our hearts. What is ruling your heart today that was never intended to rule your heart? Some common desires that, that, that often take root in our heart and and impact, impact us negatively would be relationships. Maybe the desire of a relationship that you don't now have. Or maybe, maybe the betterment of a relationship that you do have. And it started out as a good desire, but now it rules your heart. Other common desires would be acceptance. I, I want this to be a place where, we, where you feel accepted where you feel love, but sometimes that grows, it takes root in our hearts and it becomes, it becomes a, such uh, a, 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 an unmet desire that's so significant that it becomes unhealthy. Perhaps it's, it's leisure and play. It's good to go on vacation. And, and yet maybe that's ruling your heart now. Leisure and play is the, the ultimate for you. It went from being good to being a God. Maybe, maybe a common desire for you is, is the desire for respect. And, and, and in God's kingdom, every one of us, we are created with dignity and value and, and worth. And this should be a place where we find mutual respect. But maybe, maybe it's come to rule your heart in unhealthy ways. And the last common desire that I'll put up would be power and position. All these, all these can be good desires. Used by God for, 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 for great good. All these can be healthy desires in which they, that, that make you very satisfied in life. Um, but if you're a chronically dissatisfied person... If you're a chronically dissatisfied person, then this is where you need to explore. What desire now rules your heart in an ungodly way? So, um, today's sermon is, is pretty simple. I, I want us to close out our time now by being quiet. And I'm going to give you at least five minutes, maybe, if, maybe a couple extra, to, to answer this question. On your paper, you're not going to turn this in. I want you to understand that. This is a safe place. This piece of paper is a safe place for you. You get to take it home. No one's going to grade your work. No one's going to look at it but you. Um, what are you hoping for? In 2020, I'm gonna I'm gonna go through the same exercise. Let's do that. It's gonna be some quiet music playing. If you just be quiet where you are and silently attempt to answer this question, what are you hoping for in 2020? This will help you today. This will help you over the next couple of weeks as we continue down this path. All right, let's be silent and reflective together now. So my encouragement. As we continue down this path over the next 
or for two more weeks. My encouragement is that we, we continue to explore something I said on Christmas Eve. There are things that we hope for, the things that we hope for in 2020. And there are things that we hope in. This thing that I hope in will ultimately make me happy and, and all else will fail save Jesus Christ. So as we go down this path, my caution, don't hope in the things that you should merely hope for. Uh, I enjoy... I enjoy taking you down this path over the next few weeks. I enjoy explaining more um, as to how I see the, the difference between hoping in something and hoping for something. So I hope you won't miss a week. Be here next week. Be here the following week. And we'll continue down this path. Let's pray.